Oh, Julia's here. Hello, everybody. Good right. evening, Julia. To... Oh, Hiya. Kick off. Thanks, Hi, Julia. Attending. Thanks, Hello. everyone, for attending the virtual meeting for Overview and Scrutiny Task Group, Sustainable Public Transport, on Thursday, the 4th of February. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Councillor Kim Snape, and I'm the chair of this committee. Please note, this is a Teams meeting. It's been recorded, and the video screen will also be uploaded to YouTube <coughs> after the meeting. For each item, I'll invite members to use the raise hand function on your iPad to make any comments to ensure each member has the opportunity to speak and that they're not speaking over each other. Uh, when speaking, please reference the paragraph number to enable everyone to follow you. Please also mute the microphone and video feed when you're not speaking. And if the technology fails, I will join the meeting for a few minutes to try and resolve the issue. If this isn't possible, a new date and time will be organised. Can I ask all members to confirm that they can hear and speak before the meeting begins? And I'll call out each member. Julia Berry. Yes, thank you. Brilliant. Um, Martin Boardman. Uh, Val Paul. Mark Clifford. Uh, present Chair. Gordon France. Present Chair. Tommy Gray. Here Chair. Yvonne Hargreaves. Here Chair. Rory Lennox. Here Chair. June Molyneux. Good evening Chair. And um, welcome to Chris Sinnett, Deputy Chief Executive and Jonathan Nord, Director of Development in Place. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Right, we're going to apologies. Have we got any apologies? I've had no apologies, Chair. No, nope. okay. Um, item one, minutes of the meeting, Friday the 29th of January. Is everybody, although not, oh, sorry, they'll be considered at the next task group. So we'll put those at the next task group in a couple of weeks. Uh, item two, declaration of interest. Does anybody have any interest? Members are reminded of their responsibility to declare any pecuniary interest in respect of matters in the agenda. As this is a virtual meeting, if a member has a pecuniary interest, they're requested to leave the call completely rather than just mute the microphone. <coughs> the member can then rejoin the call following completion of the item in question. Any interests? Nope. Okay. Brilliant. And we'll go on to the main item on the agenda. Question and answer with Trolley Councils, Chris Sinnett and Jonathan Node. Um, All right. We've got, now we've got one question that's been submitted, so I'm hoping people are going to have questions, <laughs> considering we've got the time. So do you want, have you seen sides of the question? Yes, we have. Brilliant. So I think everybody's seen sides of that anyway, because Mark copied everybody in. So do, do you have any thoughts on that? or anything? Yeah, I mean, if I'm honest, it's one of those terrible ones for not having a really straightforward answer for you. Um, and, and Jonathan probably uh, will be able to help him, probably give him give him a couple of months to get on top of all the licensing issues uh, uh, that we'll have at Chorley that he needs to sort out. But um, it is already something that is being considered by um, the licensing um service and it's something that members have raised in the past around uh, trying to move to uh, i'm going to use the term greener vehicles and i realize that kind of is a very wide vague term um but it it currently is is not necessarily dead straightforward uh, although um uh, and jonathan will be able to give more information on this uh, the government is uh, there there are there are some changes coming uh, uh, now really uh, that may give us an opportunity to um to improve the situation in terms of uh, uh trying to move our taxi uh, taxi fleet towards a, a kind of greener low emissions um way forward um anything we do do will obviously have to be consulted on by the last uh, the, the license with the license trade it is likely that if we try and do it uh, quickly that we will get quite a lot of pushback uh, because obviously uh, the trade will view that actually that's a, a direct cost to them um but but i think it is something that we should be able to bring forward and i suspect um that is something that you you might want to consider um and i think it i i Stand to be corrected by members who were on the task and finish group. I think it is is something that was discussed when it was uh, when we had the green task group last year, um, and so uh, from then people have been kind of looking in the background at it. Jonathan, I don't know whether you've got anything more to add 
um, in the in the three weeks you've had to get your head around things. <laughs> yeah, th thanks, Chris. If, if you could just add add there, chair. Um, so, um, go government is is issuing a whole um, a whole raft of new requirements on on taxi licensing um, co coming up, um, and, and we need to be updating all our local policies to to sync in with with that. So it, it covers many, many things that the checks we have on on um, on licenses. Um, also, things like the, the equivalent of the knowledge in London that, that taxi drivers have to have. There's things like that coming in. So it's a re really good time um, to start looking at, at, at um, the age policies for vehicles, the emissions for vehicles as well. It's a really good opportunity. Um, obviously, the council's formed the Climate Change Working Group, and I, I think that this will probably appear on on the agenda for those meetings as, as well. I, I think we, we can also learn um, from the experiences of colleagues at, at South Ribble who tried to br bring in uh, a, an age policy or change the age policy a couple of years ago, and that, that didn't quite get, get there. So I think there's some, there's some lessons learned in terms of how, how we appro approach that. But I, I think it's, it's an important issue for us to be lo looking at moving forward and the time, timing is, is right for it now. Thank okay. you. Does anyone have any further comments on that? Did you want to come back on it, Mark, or and then I'll go to I think. Laura's yes, that. yeah, it, it, it's more. Um, I, I understand an issue with uh, forcing taxi operators to to buy a new vehicle. It, it might it might cause issues, but uh, it's more incentivising. What what can we do? You, you know, can can we have a separate? Um, charging, in fact, for those that are using heavy polluting vehicles to those that are uh, going to move to full electric or hydrogen. Is, can we look in, into that? To, it's more the incentives. We, that's how we're going to get our taxi fleet to, to be 100% carbon neutral, is to incentivise it. I, I, I'd need to go away and find out, but I, I have a, a, a a thought in the back of my mind, which I think must be based on something that actually is quite difficult to introduce. That basically you can you introduce your your charging schedule, and it is more split along the type of license that someone gets. I don't think there's currently legislation that allows us to uh, introduce, a, a, say, a license that is particularly for green or electric vehicles. Um, the, the, the way that a lot of, of major conurbations have got around it, and particularly London being the classic example, is is on the the charging zones. Um, but even then, uh, taxis are, are often actually excluded from those. Um, but we, we can look into it. But I think the answer is that we don't have a huge amount of room uh, to to kind of incentivise in that way. Um, what because because actually in some ways it's it's kind of just a. a is you look at it from the other perspective, it's a punishment of somebody who can't afford to, to change their vehicle. I suspect that it's more that what we would need to do is introduce a policy that when someone is renewing their vehicle or their plate, that they would need to uh, move to a, 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 a cleaner vehicle. Oh, thank you. Uh, Laura? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I've got a different perspective to come from, so it's in the sense of different question, hopefully. Um, there are two elements to sustainability. One, obviously, is, is the actual vehicles you're using and, and what the emissions and so on. And the second is the transport itself. One of the biggest issues we have in Chorley is the fact that we have very limited transport from the east to the west and round about. And I just wondered whether you picked up anything by any liaison work with LCC or with government as to how, as, as district councillors and council officers, we can attempt to influence and coerce, bribe, whatever, uh, the local, uh, LCC and the government for that matter, into doing something about actually having a service that works for the people. At the moment, we've got a bus service and to that, and to a certain extent, a train service as well that works for the operators. They like to run in a nice straight line down the road that they've run that they've run on since the state. We had stage coaches. Let's be honest. They don't want to change any of it, and they don't want to. They don't want to deviate with, uh, with the service, so they have some of the uh, particular bus service running and changing. So. 
how how can we progress on this? We, we haven't got the control. And have you got any in, indication of the 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 county council's willingness to devolve some powers to us, or the government's willingness to devolve some some authority to LCC? Um, yeah, um, unfortunately, I suspect you you may you may know you may know the answer in the way you described Councillor Lennox, the uh, the the controlling begging uh, and the rest. Um, uh, on some, I suppose to be fair, on some issues we have found ways of engaging with the county council as the highways and the transport authority, and you you can see that with the, uh, albeit that that. Um, that I think Charlie Council has more stepped in where there was a gap with the bus subsidies, but but we have found a, a way through it to be able to negotiate because in early days of negotiating on the bus services, the county were not interested in anything other than our money. So if we wanted to put money in, they were fine with that. When we tried to then negotiate with them on the routes or the times, uh, they they wouldn't have any truck at all with any discussion. I, I don't think we're at a point where uh, they will allow Chorley Council to dictate routes yet, but they have at least in the last couple of years um, taken on board um, uh, some of our views, uh, which um, I suppose it is generous of them, given that actually we're we're paying for a significant part of that route. Um, we our, our influence in some part is is predicated on the local plan and even there we have uh, a limited role in that we are not the highways authority we're not the transport authority but that is the reason that we jointly uh, with West Lanks and South Ribble commissioned the the piece of work around the transport study that was us trying to get uh, an evidence base and something that we can have that's solid to to go and have those negotiations and discussions with with the county council that there is no direct or easy route and, and I realise that uh, given my past roles in terms of uh, looking at local government reorganisation and, and, and reform, uh, I sound like I'm just getting on to climbing up onto a soapbox, but actually it is one of the issues with working in a two tier area that actually mm. um, uh, the county council holds that responsibility and um, their view is that actually um, it needs to be it needs to be done on a on a on a county sized footprint and actually for to a large extent most of us would agree with that um, for a lot of those a lot of the schemes where you need to make sure that it works with neighbouring areas the issue is that actually pretty much everything uh, other than the kind of repairs and maintenance is done on a county wide footprint and so what it doesn't pick up on is those nuances of how do you move from uh, west to east and vice versa within Chorley Borough because when you zoom out you look and you're actually looking about that connectivity around the whole of central Lancashire and so it misses uh, that that nuance of actually it's quite difficult to to move say from even Croston to Brintskull um, or Abbey Village um, without kind of doing multiple stages to your journey and, and actually the easiest way on that basis is to always travel by car uh, which is obviously largely um, a single journey and, and probably the, the kind of the worst the worst basis from a sustainability point of view. Um, but yes, we continue to try and do our lobbying, we continue to develop our action, uh, our evidence bases and we continue to work with our, our partner, partners and neighbouring councils. Uh, so obviously we've got the evident one of shared services with South Ribble and, and that closer relationship, but we do pick up and have those discussions also with West Lanks and Preston to try and build where we've got common aims and common goals uh, to be able to lobby for the on behalf of our our areas and the wider area so that was a very long-winded way of saying we don't no. have much influence <laughs> yes thank you uh gordon did you have your hand up next yes i did um yeah funny one this i mean we had stagecoach in talking about the relevant cost of electric and hydrogen uh buzzies i think 15 year old lifetime euro six diesel bus new bus now was costing something like 250,000 um i think electric was going up to just over 400 and hydrogen pretty well to close to double um two things really are electric taxis similar in cost is what i'm asking um and what are the savings and the other thing that i think may occur with government if they do go green is you'll see the price of petrol duty and diesel duty start to go up um and i just wonder what your thoughts were 
Um, I mean, this would be one way of going green, um, was to push the carbon fuels prices higher. Um, yeah, and from a taxi point of view, um, it's I suppose taxis are are cars, and so uh, you, you you see the same pattern um, as with um, anything that we would buy or lease privately, because um, because within Chorley, uh, the Hackney carriages are not your kind of classic London taxi. Uh, we don't insist on that. We have uh, different standards, uh, and so those those vehicles are the are the vehicles that you would you would purchase or lease. Um, yourself. Uh, so yes, generally electric is more expensive at the moment. Um, the, the range is significantly better because I suspect that would be a challenge uh, for some of our taxi drivers. Um, the, the, the charging points, albeit that we've got more in Chorley than certainly we did five or ten years ago, um, would, would also be a challenge. The, the running costs are, are lower. Um, I suspect another challenge that would be brought forward by the taxi community would be that um, they have greater certainty about the longevity of of, um, of uh, standard traditional cars, for want of a better term, uh, than they would for electric vehicles. That are, uh, how much can they be driven around and all the rest of it? So, um, yeah, it's very much what you would experience, and uh, I think that's why when we, if we look to do it, and we will be looking and are looking at, at changing, at seeing what we can do in terms of our um, requirements for taxis, it, it's about understanding uh, how how that would work for the taxi community. We can only regulate, um, so we can set our rules um, to encourage that behaviour. So as Councillor Clifford was saying, how can we incentivise and how can we enforce to, to move towards that? And I think that's where we need to go over the coming years. Brilliant. Um, Julia? Yeah, thank, thank you. I just want to come back on, on a bit what Chris has said, and also Laura, regarding our relationship with County Council and Transport Authority, uh, we have to hold them to account to a great degree. And also, this County Council is wearing dual hats on, on this this meeting. And um, it's really difficult. They, they are doing work at County about, you know, they have their own uh, greater, greater Lancashire transport plan. But obviously, with this, sort of the punch in the gut that we've had from um, the pandemic means that that document is now virtually shelved and probably has to be to some degree rewritten which then gives us the opportunity where we should be having fresh conversations with them unfortunately politically it's been difficult when when we when councillors have gone to, to lancashire to talk about their money and a requirement to invest more money in bus services they're, they're accused of truly of being political so and we haven't won on whatever argument they've used really but Time for fresh conversations with people. If it's a, they've done this plan as a county councillor, I've never had sight or even wind of it until recently. Um, so you know, even seen a draft of it. You know, if a new head of planning service can can um, broker that and get hands on it, then that's going to be absolutely great. But you know, we do need to be to um, to play a part in that. You know, this, and it was due to go out to consultation, like I said, but it's been it's been shelved shelved for now. So. There are there are opportunities and get some dialogue going with county, but then not waste the opportunities we've got as a, as our in our own right. You know we've got backbone, we've got ambition, we've done our own real study. We need to be a lot more aspirational. COVID has dealt us this blow where we're having to literally go back to the 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 the, 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 the you know down to looking at plan at, at planning because we either go back to old ways. Or we embrace and be radical and adopt, you know, clean. We, we want clean and green and we want connectivity and we want a bit of equity in Chorley. And that's not what we've got. I mean, in 2013, I set up uh, an organisation, just a group of just a group of people who used to hang around Chorley bus station and we used to get to use the, the vacant space there. And that's the other thing that we need to be mindful of. We need some hub and connectivity or we're going to use that bus station. For the greater good are we going to do something under the cellar of the town hall where we could have a cycle hub like they've got in places like nottingham and leicester we've got to we've got to grasp these things to improve the situation we've got in chorley and the number one thing we need to do is to consult is to get the stakeholders around the table with this connectivity and the changing way people are going to be working and living you know there's going to be more families wanting to get about and cherish and share all the things that are going on in Chorley, what's that offer going to be for them? 
and then we've got all the technology that's not waiting for anybody that's coming through um really really clever just the one thing that came from not being able to use cash on buses is that they can you can swipe your card and we can get the data from it now and the government have now asked for the data bus data you know and once we have more data you can get more efficient and more um supportive of what people's needs are for tra for traveling um so at some stage and i'll shut up, shut up now is to keep them accountable we've got to make them accountable but we haven't waste any time holding back about what we need to address the the the, the equity and when i say that for equity 2013 it effect had a, a really bad effect on perhaps what you call uh, our older citizens but we've now got the thing we should never forget about younger people and their aspirations and how they want to get about and and they've got more they want to put more a stamp on the environment than po possibly some of us who are just catching up um and we could do with you know have a transport day you know have a transport week whatever close close the streets get everybody piled in but you know, regularly consult with our young people because they're the riders, the people who are riding public transit in the future. Um, so that's just a plea and uh, thanks for raising the questions. Thank you, Julia. Do you have any comments on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you're absolutely right, Julia, in terms of the, it's the balance to be struck between the, the, the role that Chorley Council has to play in in terms of lobbying and and persuading and 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 building that relationship uh, as closely as we can with the county council to get the best for the borough, um, but also um, uh, pushing on where we found that the county council isn't prioritising something that we see as a priority at this at this point. Um, and I think that um, it is probably something that that is difficult to get right because often uh, we get told by the county council well we're, we're not doing something because you're going to do it anyway um which obviously causes its own frustrations um and so we need to be really um really clear and strategic about the schemes that we are going to support uh, bearing in mind actually we aren't the transport authority we're not the uh, highways authority but we recognise that we are a community leader and we want to do things and we're very ambitious. And I suppose that's the that's the challenge to you as councillors and, and you as a task group uh, to look and say, well, what are the real priorities? When we talk about this nebulous thing of sustainable transport, what are the real priorities where actually, regardless of what the county council decide to do or not do, uh, Chorley Council is going to intervene and, and push a particular agenda forward, uh, be that on cycle cycleways storage uh, taxis uh, trains or buses okay uh yvonne um i forgot, I forgot what i was going to say now after all of that um i was i was going to say is there an end date is there an end date to when you would expect people to have moved to electric and my other question is chris is do we have a preference given the fact that hydrogen is very expensive? I know Scotland have just actually um, have a fleet of hydrogen buses would probably cost over 100 million. But at the end of the day, do we have a preference of do we move to hydrogen or do we move to a mixture of both? And in what time scale and what sort of time scale are we going and data are we going to give the taxi drivers to actually convert to greener? Um, so I'll start with the last question first and say I don't know what timescale we'll give. We'll have to do that as part of the consultation. And actually, I think it's something we want to be really careful with and make sure we are consulting on, because actually uh, what we don't want to do is undermine what we want to achieve by it turning into an argument about whether we pick two years, 18 months, four years or whatever. We need to do it as quickly as we can, uh, but but. Um, but not in a way that actually means that actually we end up in an almighty row about the time scales and timing um, of, of implementing change. In terms of hydrogen versus electric, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the council hasn't got a position on it. Um, and I know this was actually debated in quite a lot of detail. I think at the last uh, parish liaison uh, meeting, I think there was some strong views <laughs> yeah, were. Uh, expressed. Um, uh, the reality is we don't have a view, but I suspect that um, there are 
pros and cons to either. So, you know, hydrogen should generally be better at moving bigger vehicles for longer, um, but electric is improving quite significantly. Um, the the we, the council has looked into it, and this isn't kind of from a transport point of view, but but more from a, 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 a by way of an example, we have looked into whether we can introduce uh, low emissions to either hydrogen or electric uh, vehicles as part of our fleet and um, working in street scene particularly. And at the moment, while we've got some electric vehicles, it isn't a, even vaguely um, uh, affordable for us to to, to run them. Um, and but I suspect that things will change very, very rapidly in the coming years with additional new models and vehicles coming on. I think one of the things that uh, that certainly Asim found when he was looking in from the fleet point of view, and of course this isn't about transport, uh, but when he was looking from the fleet point of view, the the options available to us were basically one or two. So it massively reduced down the market, and I suspect that that will be something that changes quite dramatically and um, fairly quickly. Fab, thank you. Thank uh, you. June? Uh, a couple of things, Chair. One so one of our recommendations from this committee could be getting to, in touch with LCC and kind of resurrecting the, the transport plan to, to get it mentioned and back on the table and also to strengthen the and encourage the links and the discussions with local people. We need to put that in and so involvement is at a local level. So yeah. I think that could be one of the things. But I'm going to go off on a different tack now. Um, <laughs> uh, how can we use the planning process to influence developers to think more about sustainable transport when they're coming up with new developments and not use it to their advantage as they are in Adlington, who they're saying have good transport links on the new development that they want to do in Carrington Road. Th good transport links, a bus every th three a day, Mm -hmm. There's bus that they actually mention the bus stops in Church Street. They don't mention no buses stop at them because it's not on a route. Yeah. And they mention the good the good rail links. Well, we do have a railway station. We do have trains that stop very, very infrequently. So they're using that to bolster their, their kind of take on it, their spin on it. So how can we influence them to think about you know, sustainable transport. Is there anything we can do? That'll be Jonathan. I was going to say <laughs> this now, I'm pleased that Jonathan's I'll on the call. There, We've Chris, got Tony here. Thank you. <laughs> Jonathan, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing from a planning perspective is, is having really strong policies that we can we can argue with developers with and, and set the standard. Um, with, with So, although our current policies go to an extent as a there's a real opportunity with, with the with the new local plan we're working on to really strengthen those policies so we get um whether it's more contributions or more infrastructure in, in into schemes uh that that's really important and obviously the, the new local plan is going to be a couple of years away so um we we may need to consider do we need to look at some short-term interim policy to try and try and set 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 the set the standard um i mean Thing, things like comments from statutory consultees and applications really help as, as well. Um, so if, if um, say, environmental health, for, for example, were commenting up on an application and they, and they raise some concerns, we could be could be seeking electric vehicle charging points, uh, and that that trying to get the infrastructure in place for things like that is is, is, is part, part of the solution. Really, is getting infrastructure right so, so we can can be charging vehicles, etc. Um, as as well but yeah um the local plan is the best opportunity but let, let's have a look at what we can do as, as an interim basis yeah just can i just come back on on one thing <laughs> you, you yeah. said about electricity electric charging points the irony is that some uh, some of these new social housing in adlington and the the bungalows for, for elderly actually have uh, electric charging points the only thing is it's social housing so the people who actually live in those houses wouldn't be able to afford an electric car and that's the irony of it the only ones that actually have the nice big four or five bedroom detached properties that they're building don't have and they're more likely to have an electric car 
I, I suppose I, I just because because actually I suspect that's that that's because of what the developers prioritise at the moment in terms of what they think someone buying a four or five bedroomed house uh, would would go. But we for. should be able and, to influence that well, and say just, they sh- yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, I, think, I suspect that Jonathan will say that it'll have to come via the local plan process. And to a large extent, the national planning policy framework is playing a significant degree of catch up, isn't it, Jonathan? And and going back to previous task groups, I, I recall us discussing something very similar about uh, broadband and the fact that actually broadband should be mm. surely to God a standard sta- a standard yeah. thing in, in properties. Um, and so I suspect Jonathan's nodding, but I suspect it's a local plan issue, but it's also constrained by the national framework. That's a nod. <laughs> <laughs> Fab, uh, Julia? Thanks. Yes, stay with planning. What is it? What can we do um, um, as far as influencing change in, in, our, in how our highways present themselves, you know, with the you know, we want we don't really want highways, we want we want greenways. Um and we've got to accommodate people who perhaps pushing prams, cycling, scooting, whatever. So we need sort of almost like wider pavements. Um and so it's almost like digging up a highway in three ways really, the green element uh, which is underpinning, but 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 making the more athletic sort of transport means um safer and cleaner and then obviously we have got what we've got which you can't call the vehicles hopefully electric what can we do at this stage you know when plan applications come to sort of set a standard that we're happy with is that more for jonathan or? yeah yeah i think so yeah i'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come in there, there chair uh, i mean there's, there's there's already some some quite good guidance out there on, on this kind of thing so so County highways are quite often referred to manual for streets, and that that does talk about um, a- access for, for other road users that, than the than the car. Um, so there is there is some standards out there. Um, certainly, the the government in the the white paper that was published last year is really really pushing this agenda. Um, so there's going to be um, a national design code for development that's that's coming out. And I, I think there's been been some seminars this 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 week. Um, about that about that and, and in um in the central lanks area we've we've already got a design guide um now, now i think that's probably probably guessing on for guessing on for 10 years old that design guide or, or the basis for it so it's 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 probably time to revise that and and look at how we best accommodate different different users so whether it's cyclists pedestrians uh people pushing pushing prams etc et so we we can be looking at, at things we, we do have some flexibilities in, in there on that. I, I know we've got Alison on the call as well. I don't know if, don't know if Alison has anything to add, add either. Alison? Um, hello, yes. Um, the government have just done another consultation. They've issued on uh, guidance um, for design. So we will be looking at that in the next couple of weeks and uh, probably bringing it uh, uh, for consideration because we will have to do a consultation response. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question, Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is a sort of mixture to do with buses, but also planning. Um, we heard from Stagecoach at a, at a previous meeting that a lot of developments now that we're seeing coming along, that they're not near a primary route, that there's no chance of getting a decent bus service to them, therefore they shouldn't go ahead. Now, we say, we're, you know, we're not the transport authority. We we own Chorley bus station. Is there anything stopping us uh, in, in an interim policy, uh, putting a section 106 agreement on some new developments that they must fund a Chorley circular bus route that actually, I'm, I'm a big fan of having things in public hands rather than private hands that actually as Chorley Council, we have a small bus company. If you remember anybody who remembers the old mini links that we used to have whizzing around Chorley, that actually, do we have the capacity to take that on and charge section 106 to the developers to fund it? That's uh, my question. Any thoughts? 
I think Jonathan will be able to probably help better with the Section 106 and what's eligible or not. In terms of the uh, bus company, to be honest, it was something that we we didn't go put huge amounts of, of, of work into and didn't go into huge amounts of detail, but we did uh, kind of consider it and, and, and look into it on a very, very high level basis. Um, when we first started getting involved in, in picking up the subsidies, the reality is that it is very difficult to get into uh, the bus market in terms of uh, the costs and the setup costs, um, uh, because whilst it's very deregulated, there are some significant uh, costs of doing it. I, I did quite often joke that the chief executive seems to want to uh, start to being, becoming a bus driver, um, but um, it basically would be extremely expensive to do. So the council couldn't afford to do it. Could we afford to do it through Section 106? I suspect that if, if we were able to charge Section 106, I suspect the issue is it's the ongoing nature of those costs, because a lot of those routes are the ones that would require a significant and very heavy subsidy. And I suppose that is the um, often the issue uh, with, with bus services, that whilst they should be well used, uh, they're not well used. And you end up with a, 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 a negative cycle where virtually no one uses them. So uh, quite a few of those services that we uh, originally um, subsidised were used by virtually no one for most of the time. But then they're hardly used because actually they're not convenient. They don't work. And uh, for people in terms of getting to school, work uh, and going out, um, because they're very long and they take you a, a very long way and they, they don't work at the right times. Um, but because then they're not used, uh, they need subsidising. And so w basically, I think we couldn't afford to do it as Jolly Council. I think it would depend on Section 106, but Section 106 is generally a one off payment. And so uh, if you were if it was an eligible thing, I think it'd be quite difficult to sustain over the long term. But Jonathan might be able to help in terms of the legalities of it. Jonathan. Yeah, th thanks. I mean, F funding bus services is something that does come out of section 106 is sometimes particularly on um, on large schemes when they do a, a transport assessment and travel plan it, it may identify a need to to divert a, an existing service or or deliver a new service what what tends to happen is is that um the, the request for funding will be limited to say run the service for for say a three to five year period and, and quite often um, those services end up ceasing after the five year period because they're either not not used enough or they're not commercially um, vi viable at the at the end of end of that period. So, so one of one of six is they tend to work in, in quite a short short time frame, three to five years, say. But after after that, they, they tend to fall fall off a bit. Um, obviously, in Chorley, you do have community infrastructure levy as, as another um, element of funding within there as as well, which which um, all all new houses would would contribute towards um as, as well and that and that provides you a probably a more secure pot um but again it, it is a one-off payment though um so it it, it does have does have its risks on it thanks for that uh julia yeah um just taking up on about this um circular bus service rather than um how you'd fund it but we have a an existing service around community transport and I'm quite disappointed that no initiatives have come out recently about how you know to fill in the, the gaps and the fact that we've got vulnerable people moving about the borough now going for testing and vaccinations and whatever and this is going to be ongoing and, and actually that's not that's not all that's just that's that's today's need but actually shopping and visiting relations and all sorts of things is always going on but the community transport offer that we have hasn't got the capacity and and mostly they booked up with regular regular trans uh, regular riders and in some ways if there was an investment in that service then we had some sort of control over it or, or it's just you know we we um we did some surveys on it to find out what what do, do actually what do people want as far as a bus service they could actually organise it like at the beginning of the week, they could take bids for who they're going to pick up and then organise it amongst the fleet. You know, if people cooperated who've got vehicles, customers could put their bids in, you know, about wanting to go shopping at the end of the week. And, and that, co that cooperative could almost like deal with the capacity that's required and get those people. So it's not like a, 
putting on a bus and no one's getting on it, it be meeting a need that you can create by just giving people perhaps digital access and making it more accessible. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, um, there's different models of community transport, which I, I know Julia will probably actually know better than I, I um, will, uh, but but it is something that we could pick up through um, uh, the communities team in terms of as a as as a kind of more cooperative and 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 volunteering effort. There is obviously the the Central Lancashire Dial Arrive, which has a, a, a slightly different uh, version of that, which the council already funds. Now we we have increased our funding because the county council uh, retended and significantly changed. Uh, uh, how they were doing it and and withdrew a significant amount of funding from it um, and uh, one of the things that we wanted to do with dial ride when we were first talking to them was that we were going to work with them to help them to develop their offer and help them to to, to, to develop their their model uh, for how they uh, provided uh, that transport to, to people who needed it um, it has taken a little bit of a back a back seat during COVID, but also uh, it needed to take a bit of a back seat because uh, Central Lancashire Dial Rides uh, concentration had to be then placed around uh, the County Council's um, retendering exercise, where they had to get themselves in a position to be able to bid as part of a consortium, um, and so um, it it kind of took a knock. But it is something that we can we can kind of pick back up. Brilliant, thank you. I had a couple of questions i just wondered um is there any update on chorley council taking over the bus interchange because i know that was sort of on the cards so it was in discussions last year wasn't it and then the other question i had was um around the train stations obviously as a borough so sort of like when you look at it on the map we're quite well served with the number of train stations that we've got not necessarily with the services that back it up however i just wondered whether or not there's anything the council could be doing or in terms of any recommendations out of this task group as to how they, you know, how the, those stations could support sort of local economic development and social development to get more people into the borough. Because a lot of them are gateways, you know, for example, Adlington, you know, there's a lot of large employers in Adlington, how we can encourage more people to to be using the train service to come to work and when we've got events and you know Croston um you know there's loads of things to go and visit in Croston but I suspect very few people come into Croston via the rail service just wondered if we don't seem to sort of do any of the sort of check out Chorley stuff and things like that at the at the, the railway stations do we I just wondered if there's any thoughts on that or no, actually, I think I think you're right. We have we have done some of the checkout Chorley stuff, and we've done some of the um, choose Chorley, the business stuff um, at uh, Chorley railway station, and I think sometimes Bookshaw um, as the kind of a higher footfall ones. But actually, there is a. I think certainly for the checkout Chorley, there is an argument to say, well, actually, you know, we should pick some of those outlying areas of the borough because they're often near to the places where we're showing off about. Uh, so that I think does make sense. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the bus station, uh, discussions are continuing. Um, it, uh, the the county council there there would be an ongoing cost to uh, Chorley Council to uh, to take over the management of uh, of the bus station, which I think uh, the council would be happy to do. Uh, but it's currently subject to some negotiations with the county council, uh, who would be in essence making a saving, uh, but possibly aren't recognising their their role in that and and how that the quid pro quo should really work. Uh, I certainly think the administration recognises that uh, controlling the bus station provides us opportunities to to influence um, those bus services to a certain extent, but also to make sure it is a good gateway into the town and it feels like not like a kind of bolt on to the end of edge of the town, but actually is fully integrated in, into into welcoming people into into Chorley and, and importantly uh, some of the assets we we own very close to the bus station um and then um and then finally in terms of the um the the potential other recommendations that you, you in relation to train stations i think we probably need to be thinking about i know alison mentioned to me that um we we haven't managed to get someone from greater manchester to come and talk to us and um, but obviously they have got quite ambitious plans around firstly bus franchising but then secondly also about uh, 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 
I think they're calling it integrated ticketing and smart ticketing. But when it was originally talked about about three or four years ago, it was a, the Northern Oyster. Um, and I think they've kind of struggled with that. Um, but I suspect at some point uh, they they will manage to bring something forward around that. And, and I think that that is something that that Chorley as a borough would need to really respond to. We ideally would want to be able to access uh, that because I think otherwise it could present a, a significant challenge to our borough um, as people find it easier and they already do find it cheaper uh, to go and catch the train, for example, from Horwich. Um, uh, and, and it starts to pull the economic activity of people outside of our borough rather than encouraging them to recognise it as very close to Greater Manchester and, and something they want to work with. So I do think that is something we will need to keep an eye on uh, in the coming years. Yeah, definitely, because it's already, I mean, we see it in Adlington, people, um, yeah, you're out across the piece, people go and park at Black Rod or Horwich, don't they? And yeah. then they'll go shopping at the Reebok rather than in Chorley or yeah. in the village and stuff. Um, Laura, do, do you have some question? Thank you, Chair. I just wondered, since you've been talking about leverage and discussions about the bus station, is whether that it's an opportunity to get some a bit of leverage in, and discussion about the the bus service that connects the bits of Chorley to to the, the main routes through um, because when we actually come into the issue of subsidizing buses you remember Chris we ended up with a situation where we Chorley was going to end up subsidizing a bus that we didn't actually want uh, because they can only think of, of of the way they want to the way they want to run it, not the way the people want them to run it. So, does that give us any opportunity to to rediscuss that again? So we we've ended up with a, a, a subsidised service that that actually takes people to Preston um, from Ashley Village, but in actual fact they can get a much faster service to, to Preston. They can get on the one two five. It's just they can't get onto the one two five. You know. It's that story again, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so you would hope so, uh, to be honest, Laura. Uh, but I, I, the most recent letter I saw back from the county wouldn't indicate they're interested in negotiating at the moment. Um, right. And I suspect that um, uh, I suspect we probably need to wait and see in the coming months whether kind of the position changes. But yes, I think that th th those negotiations, I think the hope is that we would be able to 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 draw it all together in the idea that yeah. actually well let's try and make sure that public transport makes sense to people which it often doesn't do at the moment yeah thank you thanks julia yeah it was just to pick up on a, that sort of the idea of smart cards and apps and where we're going to be not in five years we're probably going to be there in, in less than a year really in some aspects of uh, transportation getting all joined up and It'd be wonderful if we could host something, talk to Greater Manchester a lot more, bring them in and talk about developing apps for the future really that are going to give us this equity and give us this mobility. And it's almost like, um, you know, you get some apps that you, or cars, whatever, you get bonus points for going and checking in places or whatever, you know, this, game, this gamification thing, which is appeals to probably younger people, but the, it just opens up a whole lot of things about joint interest with, you know, whether it's a shop, whether it's a takeaway, whether it's, um, you know, visiting Astley Hall or whatever, just bringing stuff together that's so accessible for people and, and, and people can get about and almost like, you know, whether it's car sharing, a bus ride, whatever mode of transport, and there's, there must be at least 20 different modes of uh, acceptable public transport at the moment. Um, Let's just be at the forefront of it. You know, when you talk, when you bring, bring all these business people in and, and obviously with strawberry fields on the doorstep, you know, is it, is it is the scope for us being involved in forming something quite radical around connecting transport systems? Bob, any comments? I, well, I, I saw Alison's hand go up just as Councillor oh, Barry sorry, was yeah, talking, Alison, so I suspect yeah. she's probably a better place person to answer with uh, with with authority. <laughs> I'm not sure of the authority, Chris, but um, certainly um, I can see the benefits of having an app that connects everybody. We have invited Arriva Click to come, who are bus service, and they've been um, doing app services around parts of um, Liverpool and I think it's Walsall and we're hoping that they're going to come to the next meeting middle of uh, February so that, that we can see how they do everything and, and 
basically pick their brains on the costs and how they found it. OK, thank you. Fab, thank you, Alison. Any further comments or questions? I think we'll wind it up. No, I appreciate your time anyway, um, no Chris and Jonathan, and, and thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kim. Thank, thank you. you very much. Well, Thanks. We'll Thanks. Um, Bye -bye. the next meeting. What, when's the next meeting? The next meeting is the 18th of February at five o'clock, and I think that's going to be. Did Alison said we've got a, hopefully have a Reva click come in, and hopefully we should have the um, be able to have a look at the report, the report, and discuss our recommendations for that that particular meeting, and then we're hoping for it to well, go some, to. Sorry, June. Well, some have been. We've suggested some recommendations as we've been going along, haven't we? Yeah, the, yeah. Alison and uh, Matthew have been making notes and stuff, yeah. so we'll um, we'll have something to work off for then, and then um, hopefully it'll go to. Scru will, it, will it go to scrutiny and will it go to the scrutiny and then the cabinet meeting or it should go to ONS first and then cabinet yeah yeah so that's great so we're nearly there Bob so thanks for your time everybody and uh, have a good evening have a safe journey thank from you. your couch <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you bye. see ya bye bye, bye. 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 good night